Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, college football fans across the nation and around the world. This is Tim May with the Tim May Podcast. And as you know, I'm always joined every week at this time. Uh, you ought to be considered my co-host, but, you know, I think most of you think of him as a sidekick, Boston Ward. Boston, uh, welcome again to the Tim May Podcast. It is always my pleasure to be on your show. And I'm always thinking about it. I know it is, man. I, that, that, that's, uh, that, that goes without saying. Uh, bottom line is I, I'm, I'm always – paying attention to what people say about our podcast, at least most of the kind of good stuff, you know, and a little bit of the bad stuff. And one of those people is my daughter, Caroline, who listens to every podcast, but she says, dad, you got to uh, got to do something about the audio, you know, maybe uh, the spit takes or whatever, the pop in, et cetera. Sometimes you get on the peas. And so along my old on Father's Day, she gave me this nice little uh, new uh, microphone with a, uh, I call it pops, pop stopper. A uh, little screen that goes in front of it. I just want to make sure people didn't think I was like uh, going nuts here or had a teleprompter in front of me. But uh, what do you think about my new setup? I'll, I'll work so, on it as as it goes as we as we go along through the through the weeks now. But what do you think, Austin? It's uh, pretty sweet. Uh, it looks like you're in the recording studio, ready to make a pop album. So it's pops, pops, pop, three pops in there, maybe. I don't yeah, know. yeah, yeah. Pop, looks great. pop album, pop stopper. It looks great and it sounds great. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. And that was Boston Ward. I mistakenly called him Austin a minute ago, but you know who I'm talking about. But, uh, you know, I've got a, in my opinion, I've got a really interesting show today because uh, my uh, guest is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, as I told him when I was talking to him earlier, I've known since he was zero years old, you know, Graham Rayall. And you go, Graham Rayall, he's a race car driver. No, if you know anything about Graham Rayall, he's probably the biggest Columbus sports fan by Columbus, I mean Columbus area sports fan in the world, even though, or one of the biggest, even though he lives in, in Indianapolis now. He grew up in uh, New Albany, as most people know. Uh, he's actually in Lake Tahoe when I'm talking to him on the podcast here in a minute, uh, at the home of his in-laws, uh, who have a place at Lake Tahoe. His in-law, of course, his father-in-law is John Force, the uh, perennial uh, funny car champion uh, in, in drag racing. His, uh, his wife is Courtney Force, who was a uh, former champion uh, uh, funny car driver who's now expecting their first child. So he's pretty, uh, Graham's pretty uh, peaked about that. But, uh, you know, his season just got underway a couple of weeks ago at Texas, and uh, they're going to re, re go uh, re-up it uh, July the 4th of the race at uh, Indianapolis on the road course. Uh, but, but I digress. The point is the reason I wanted to have him on is because he is very astute fan of Ohio State football in particular. Really good friends with uh, Mark Pantone. Uh, really good, pretty good friends with Urban Meyer and uh, with uh, Brian Hartline. And also, he's kind of growing uh, in friendship with Ryan Day. But he knows the players' comings and goings. He he ebbs and flows with the fans just like anybody else did. And the way he talks about that uh, uh, Fiesta Bowl <laughs> loss in quotes. Uh, I think that'll touch the heart of most Ohio State fans, but you know, you know of Graham Ray, all right? Absolutely, and you know, I think does he just use the helmet once a year, or does he does he bust it out several times? I think seeing him with the racing helmet when he puts on the the Buckeye leaves and the stripe, um, I, I feel like I can count on that showing up in my timeline and people going crazy over that. It's like it's a nice little crossover between those two sports because I don't feel like I mean, obviously, you are a big fan of both. I'm not a big motorsports fan. So I don't know that there's always a big crossover, but he certainly has a loyal fan base uh, because of putting on that one helmet, however often he does it. If there's Buckeye fans that want to cheer for somebody in auto racing, he's certainly got the inside track there. Well, hey, let's just, without further ado, let's get to my interview with uh, Graham Rail. And then stay tuned, ladies and gentlemen, because immediately afterward, uh, Boston Ward and I have a few pertinent things to talk about when it comes to Ohio State football past, present, and way into the future. <laughs> and as promised, ladies and gentlemen, I'm back with Graham Rayall, a guy, a race car, big time, IndyCar driver, and other ilks of uh, driving, racing, that I've known since he was zero years old. Graham, welcome to the <laughs> Tim May Podcast. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. And you know, I, I introduced this before, but the reason I wanted you on uh, is that I consider you not just a hell of a race car driver, but a consummate sports fan otherwise, especially of things to do 
uh, with locally Ohio State, Columbus, et cetera. And you know where I'm going with that, Ohio State football. And uh, I'm not sure how much you care about basketball. I think you do when they're winning, but uh, which is an ultimate fan. But also the Columbus Blue Jackets. And just put me in, the, in your mind right now, how much on – I don't know if pins and needles are right words, but how, how much are you concerned that, number one, an Ohio State football season is going to take place? Well, I'm not I, – I hope it does. I, I, I you know, I, I guess I'm one of the people that certainly understands the severity of this COVID-19. I've had friends that have gotten it. Uh, I think, fortunately, the friends of mine who have been affected, it's been pretty mild. Um, most of them, it's been loss of taste, and literally that was it for about yeah. a few days. Um, having said that, I'm also one of the people that I think we got to get, we got to get back to, you know, life a little bit as usual. Um, we have to understand that this is going to be part of life going forward, just like the flu is. I mean, you can take the flu shot every year. doesn't mean you're not going to get the flu no matter what they say. It's chance, right. you know, chance is still there. So, you know, we all have to kind of face that a little bit. Um, so I'm not downplaying it, but I also think Ohio State football, Ohio State ba- basketball, any Ohio State athletic event, Blue Jackets, IndyCar racing. It's a part of the fabric of society, and it keeps people motivated, and it keeps us – it gives us something to look forward to, and it keeps us going. And so, you know, to me, I think we have to have college football. I just don't see a reason not to. Um, just like we have to have racing. And, you know, we've gone back to it. Uh, we're going to continue to to ramp up and increase and have more and more fans as we head towards mid-Ohio there, end of July, early August. Yeah. Um, you know, and, I, and I'm excited about that. So. You know, for me, it's uh, we we got to kind of get back to life, and I, I hope that. Uh, trust me, if we don't have football, I really don't know. I really don't know what the heck I'm going to do uh, this fall. Yeah, dude. I mean, multiply that times ten with a guy like me. I mean, I've been I've been a college football fan since I was four or five years old. Since I yeah. remembered remembering, you know what I mean? <laughs> oh yeah. And uh, and uh, and I know you. You're the same way, man. I mean, you know, you, your dad took you you to some Ohio State games when you were a little bitty guy. Matter of fact, you well, you and him were on the sideline that night in '98 when they got beat by Michigan State. Remember that? Well, I also I also will say this that I mean, if you're an Ohio State fan, you're feeling good this year. Yeah, you're feeling exactly. good last year, but you're really feeling good this year. So, yeah. you know, with that being said, too, it's like, you know, um, I just feel like it would be a real shame not for us not to have football. I mean, so uh, you know, I'm I'm excited about that, and and uh, like I said, I, I mean, I don't know. I was texting with Coach Meyer the other day. You know, he feels confident it's going to happen. Yeah. You know, Pantoni, I talk to almost daily. Uh, and, you know, everybody seems confident it's going to happen. You know, the face of it, the way that it might look might be a little bit different. But, again, I'm not – I look, it's not the industry I'm in. I'm just a fan speaking and hoping and praying right. that we're going to have football. What, it's only like 10 or 11 more Saturdays until that gets going. So, hopefully it, uh, hopefully it happens. But, you know, I think we're seeing the same thing in racing. It can still happen. The health screenings might be a little bit different. Are you going to pack 105,000 in there every weekend? Maybe not. But I also think – at what point do humans get to make their own decisions? And if you're willing to take the risk of like, of going, you should be able to take the risk of going and being in the stands and doing that. That That's the way I feel. You know, people are talking about the Indy 500 in August. Oh, we can't have 350,000 people. Okay. We're not going to have 350. It's not going to sell out naturally. It's not going to sell out because of what is going on. Yeah. But if 250 decide they want to come hang out on a hot Saturday, Sunday afternoon, August 23rd, they should be able to do that. That is their we'll choice. See. And yeah, so we'll see. We'll see what happens. Well, I would argue a little bit of counter to that. I mean, I, I do think I do think in this situation, the, the way this thing, uh, well, the way you can contract this, you have as much of an obligation to the person sitting next to you to make sure you're okay than than they as they do to you. You know what I mean? That's what's been sure. weird. That's what that's the that's the uh, the uh, crux of this or the conundrum of this is. You know, as soon as the vaccine is found, we're all we're all good, right? But yeah. you don't know. I mean, I was down in Texas visiting my mom for the first time in two months a couple of weeks ago and because uh, they had everything shut down. As soon as I leave, I'm hearing about all this popping going on in Houston and even the little town I was in, Lufkin, and I'm just going, you know, did I just escape, you know, or who knows? In two weeks, I'll find out, you know. But, I mean, so that's kind of the, the unknown, the jeopardy you face. But you're exactly right, though. The flip side of it is people are so, so hungry for live sports. Yeah. Uh, 
And uh, I know you know that. I mean, you were hungry to get back into the race car, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, we – and look, I completely agree with you. Uh, I do think that human responsibility for each other has to continue to, to rise. And, that, you know, at the, at the end of the day, too, the way that we approach daily life, I don't know I'll ever have a car or my wife's purse or anything without hand sanitizer ready to go, right? Right. So that's going to be part of it. Same with me at the racetrack. You know I'm a guy who bites my nails a lot. I mean, that's going to have to change. Uh, or I'm going to have to literally carry, a, you know, a pump of, of hand sanitizer with me everywhere I go at the racetrack. So there are things that are going to change. We've got to take care of each other yeah, for sure. But, yeah, I, I was excited to get back in Texas. It was a shame. You know, we really kind of shot ourselves in the foot there. We, we started really well. Uh, or we're supposed to. And then obviously we had the issues where the engine wouldn't start. Uh, we've kind of dug into all of that. We're going to make some changes, make sure it doesn't happen again. Um, you know, in, in our situation, though, I felt like we did a great job being prepared because truthfully, uh, our car was fast. Our race car was fast. Were we as fast as Scott Dixon who won? No, we weren't. We weren't going to win. But were we faster than the Penske cars that finished second and third? Yes, yes we were faster than them. So, we, we, we hurt ourselves pretty badly there. Um, you know, but off we go now. You know, we're going to gonna head off to uh, Indy for the Grand Prix, um, what, in two weeks' time. Uh, then the week after that's Road America for a doubleheader weekend. The weekend after that's Iowa for a doubleheader. Uh, and then we go to Mid-Ohio. So I'm excited about, you know, what the next couple of months looks like. Um, I just hope we can get this all in. Because where, where do we differ than football? I mean, if college football doesn't happen this year, Ohio State's still going to be – Okay, they're going to survive. If we don't, if we don't happen, and our sponsors go, "Hey, we're we're done," you know, this isn't out <laughs> yeah. for us. Yeah. We are done. I mean, our, yeah. my career could be over like that. So, you know, it's important uh, for us to continue to push forward. NBC announced today that they're going to put three of our first four races on NBC Main Channel, which is awesome uh, for us. And so, hopefully, that'll help us continue to build and and make up for some of the stuff we might miss. I was going to say, hey, tell everybody, though, what was it like? I mean, everybody's had that moment. Everybody's had that moment in their life when they went out to start their car in the morning and the battery was dead and it didn't yeah. start. I mean, what is it like to be primed to start your first race of the year after this long wait, and which is what happened to you in Texas? You qualified extremely well. Matter of yeah. fact, I even texted you before that race. I don't know if you even got it, but that uh, I had a good feeling about you that night, just the way things were going, you know. And then, boom, your car doesn't start. Well, yeah. How? What kind of sinking feeling is that? It's bad. It's bad. <laughs> yeah. You know, particularly when you know we start up front, right? Uh, yeah. we're, we're in good position there. Um, typically, in the most difficult situations, is when we rise to the occasion as a team and, and individually. And so it was a shame to not even get a chance. Yeah. You know, I yeah. mean, it was, it was a shame to not even get an opportunity to go out there uh, and, and try to compete. We, we, we were just on defense the entire night, right? Because I couldn't yeah. go attack guys. I couldn't go driving around guys who were two laps ahead of me and cause an accident or something. That's not, you don't want to be that guy. No. Uh, my dad always says I may be a little bit too nice. I don't know, but, you know, you certainly don't want to be that guy, but yeah, I mean, we're ready to go. I'm on the grid. I'm in the car. I'm fired up and it doesn't start. And it's well, like, hey, yeah. What? Well, remind me, remind me of this though. I'm trying to remember. Uh, I, I thought you had a Fiesta Bowl moment too, because didn't y'all get a penalty because y'all worked on the car before the, you know, I mean, we did. Wasn't that, wasn't that like a double whammy? I mean, we did. Was, so because we fixed the car behind the pit wall. I got a penalty because I drove out from behind the pit wall to start the race. Right. Well, I didn't know that was a rule. I truly didn't know that you're not allowed. Had they pushed me four feet forward, we were okay. Yeah. It just, it, that's a joke of a rule. Number yeah, one. Pretty much. Number, number two, we're already a lap down. Why are you beating me up? You know, I mean, yeah, exactly. Come on now. Exactly. Uh, but yeah. So, um, what a joke, but, and I also got a penalty later in the race. We were only allowed to go 35 laps on a f stint of fuel. Yeah. I, we actually did 36, and we did, we, we did make the mistake. But I found out four other guys did the same thing in the race and didn't get a penalty. I'm still waiting for a legitimate answer from IndyCar on why that was the case, but I'm sure welcome that'll be the, Welcome to the NFL. Welcome to college football, my brother. Oh, man, yeah. Dude. Yeah, it wasn't a fumble. It no. wasn't a fumble. You're looking you back. Know, everybody else says it was a fumble. You're looking back on that Fiesta Bowl. What was the call? I mean, Sean Wade, that was negative. That, 
that could have been called either way, and they called it that way. You know, he did drop his head a little. He didn't really – he didn't launch, but the quarterback dropped his head. Okay, that's what happens sometimes. That's almost the opposite of serendipity is what can go wrong for you. But the – is the Okuda strip, uh, Jordan Fuller pickup score taken off the board, is that the one that will always – live with you as a fan of being wronged? I think there's no doubt. Um, there's no doubt that that was absolutely wrong. That was wrong. Yeah. It wasn't even two steps. It was four. Yeah. It was wrong. Every other ref on the planet would tell you it was wrong. I'm sure Clemson would even in hindsight probably tell you, yeah, you know, maybe. Oh, yeah. But, but the Sean Wade thing, you know, the very next play, you know, so it always works out. That's so it always happens. Or, or the next two or whatever it was. Yeah. Trevor Lawrence goes, runs a thing into the end zone. That immediately flipped the script. They go three and out. They punt the ball back to us there. We're on a mission. You go down and score. You're now up 23 to zero or whatever it would have been. That ball game is, I got to tell you, I think that ball game's over. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But all of a sudden, you know, the roles are reversed. You get JK, you know, who's an absolute animal, get the ankle not feeling so good. And, you know, same thing, I, I got to look at – if I look back at the end of that year, I just wish I could have seen a healthy Justin Fields at the end of that year. Yeah. I yeah. wish I could have seen, you know, that, that knee in good condition against – I mean, he played lights out anyway. But if he had been able to run like we saw early in the year, that's yeah. a whole nother level. But you could tell at the end it just wasn't right, right? So that yeah, that, yeah. that Clemson game should have been – it should have gone the other way. But obviously we can't live in a in a fake world, you know. It didn't. Uh, but, you know, I said – and I still think I, – I, I'm just so – I think the biggest recruit that Ryan Day has had is getting Sean Wade to come back because uh, that kid's a stud, and I think he's going to be – he's going to be awesome. I was going to say, that's what I want to get to. I mean, let, let's, let's talk briefly about the Blue Jackets because most people tune into this podcast and listen – talk about the Buckeyes. But – how excited are you? Because I want to get back to the Buckeyes. How excited are you? Do you think the Blue Jackets, this quarantine, COVID quarantine situation has been uh, a little bit of a, a blessing because they're getting these oh, yeah. guys, they're going to be having these guys back. And what's your sense of what they'll be like when they come back? Hey, if well, they come back. You know, I got to think that, um, I got to think that, that, you know, yes, you know, to get Seth, to get, all over all these guys that have been pretty banged up to get them back is, is a blessing. Um, you know, it's interesting though, because the best the blue jackets played all year was when most of those guys were hurt, you know, and you Good had point. a bunch of guys you'd never heard of, you know, yeah. you had Gerby throwing them in the net all the time and stuff like that. I think, you know, I'm not, I, I, I'm not saying that the best guys aren't the best guys. They are, but I hope they can come back out with that camaraderie that they had in their playoff run in the past last year in particular. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and make it happen. I mean, you know, you've got a lot of talent there. Um, Wierenski, to me, is Wierenski is the, the unsung hero, the guy that seemingly does it all and yeah. gets no credit somehow. Yeah. Is always going to be in Seth's shadow. Uh, but Zach has played, you know, played great this year. You know, I just hope if they can get back out there, they can keep it going. But, yeah, I mean, you got Cam who had, a, had an injured wheel there for a while. Hopefully he – He's all completely healed up. I know he was back towards the end of it, but still kind of hobbly a little bit. You know, Seth's obviously back from his, his, his leg injury and everything else. So, you know, I mean, they get a lot of potential. Um, Toronto's not, no joke, for sure. Uh, but I actually feel pretty good that they, they, can, beat, they can beat Toronto. Um, and then from there, just I, I'm not sure where, who, who would be the next, you know, round. But – yeah, uh, I'm excited. I'm excited by it. You know, I've, I've talked to some of those guys. I do talk to, I hear from Cam quite a bit. I can catch up with, with the captain, uh, Nick. He's, that's a, he's a great man. That guy. Yes. Um, talk to him, you know, a little bit, particularly when it was kind of going on and, and, uh, the season was, was playing out, uh, a little bit, but you know, I hope they can get back out there because I live for that too. You know, everybody knows me as a diehard Buckeye and I am, but every night I, I don't miss the Jackets game. I mean, I just don't, you know, whether it's a watch it on my phone, watch it on TV, I'm, I don't miss them. So, you yeah. know, I hope they'll get back out there. Yeah. I mean, I think it could be something special. I, I mean, really, you've got a sense of that because it's kind of like 
the force is coming back together, so to speak, the way I look at it. You're right, though, about the momentum they had at the end there with guys just sort of sucking it up and playing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just regardless, the, the challenge. I want to get back to the Buckeyes real quick. Who who of the young uh, of people, you know, like like we said, by the way, ex- explain to people why you have a relationship with Mark, Mark Pantone. I mean, who is basically one of the geniuses behind what is this program. I mean, you know, they're on pace right now to have the greatest – recruiting class in terms of how players are graded perhaps yeah. in history, not just Ohio state history, but in college football history. But uh, where did, where did that relationship come from in a nutshell? Well, my relationship with Mark started the same way that my relationship with my wife started, which was on Twitter. From there, uh, you know, really he and I got in touch. I came into town, um, you know, went obviously to the Woody to see him and spend some time. And we went to dinner and kind of just hit it off. I mean, Mark's a great guy. And what I enjoy as a fan, I'm fortunate, I'm, I'm spoiled because I love his insight. I love his insight. I'm not going to name names or anything like that. But what I love about Mark is when you're like, hey, man, are you going to get this lineman? He's a five-star. It's you versus Alabama or you versus whoever. And he'll say, hey, no, his personality doesn't fit our team. Or, hey, yeah, we're going to go hard after him. I love that insight. Um, mm-hmm. Because you don't, you just don't, you know, as a fan, you don't say, oh, man, they lost out on this guy. Yeah. And it's like, well, there might be a real reason behind that, that they didn't try very hard. You know? Yeah, so exactly. I love, I love that aspect of what, um, of that, of, uh, of talking to Mark and picking his brain about all of that. Um, but yeah, it kind of started that way. Uh, he and I talk quite a bit. I see him every time I come back to Columbus, I, I see him uh, for sure. And uh, he's just a great guy who's, who's, I think, finally getting the recognition that he probably deserves because he's as big a part as anybody as far as building, you know, building these teams that we're seeing and identifying talent and everything else. Yeah. But, you know, ultimately, is, he's, he's, a, he's a super guy. I know. He, he's, you know, he, 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 he'll come into a room and, you know, he's not going to come in here and try to lord over the room. But if you get him in a corner, he's one of the most interesting people you can ever – have a conversation with, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. what strikes me about him is how just intelligent he is, you know? Oh, yeah. And he's always you – can, you can look in his eyes. He is always thinking. I mean, you know what I mean? He's one of those dudes. And uh, yeah. what, what, what was your impression of what Ryan Day did last year as a first-time head coach? You got a sampling of it those first three games in 18. But, you know, I would think, you know, you being an Ohio State fan, this is a first-time head coach. You, you had to have some, I don't know, trepidation a little bit uh, they're handing the keys to a guy who's only been a head coach for three games I just I really didn't because when I met coach day and he probably wouldn't even remember meeting me but I came into the facility with Pantone uh and coach Meyer was giving me a tour and walked me through and walked me through all to meet all the different coordinators and everybody else I've known Hartline a long time so when yeah. saw him and I kind of stopped in the offensive room for a little bit because uh, Coach Wilson obviously was in Indiana, so he was in tune with IndyCar racing and what we do. And so we stopped and chatted about that. And when I met Coach Day, it was clear to me, number one, his IQ level, his intelligence. Just you can tell by talking to people. It's yes. really, I, I know that sounds like that should be the case, but I can't tell you how sometimes you talk to people like Kawhi Leonard. I'll use that as an example. I met with Kawhi Leonard once. The guy is so intelligent. There's no – I mean, absolutely it makes sense why he's so good at basketball. He was sitting there quizzing me about racing. Hey, what do you do – you know, you, you prepare for this. What do you do for that? Always trying to learn, right? Racing yeah. is totally different than basketball, but you could tell. Coach Day was the same way. So it really didn't surprise me. The other thing that didn't surprise me is talking to Mark or talking to Hartline. They love the guy. They love the guy. And so, to me yeah. – it was like, yeah, th- you know, he's got it. He's got it, that's for sure. And he's got the weapons, and he's been there. And the players have the relationship with him. What surprised me is just the fact that Urban recruited as well as anybody in the history, and yet here's Ryan Day putting up stuff we've never seen before, right? Slamming it. Yeah, he's slamming it. You just have to worry. I know he's booked to be with Ohio State for the long term. But you got to wonder, you know, when some NFL team is going to come and offer a ton of money. I mean, yeah, you know this, unless your ego is such that you've just got to win a Super Bowl in your life or you're, before you die, like Nick Saban's was, 
he found out that wasn't paradise. You yeah. Know? <laughs> Came back to college football. Unless you're like that, man, the colleges, as you know, uh, this year's not a good example, but the colleges can match any offer by, by an NFL nope. team. But no, no doubt. I mean, but I know but, what you're talking about. Yeah. But if you're in the NFL, you're not pulling a Harbaugh and sleeping in a sleeping bag at some 16 year old's house, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's the difference. You're, you, you know, you're you're coaching you, football. Yeah, you're coaching football. The recruiting side, and I know because I talked to some other coaches who had left college to go to pro. I said, why? I said, really. It's because of the recruiting. The recruiting trail requires so much time and dedication. Oh, yeah. Where Ohio State is maybe very special is you've got Larry Johnson. He doesn't need to sell himself. Yeah. That's pretty easy. You don't need Coach Day to go in with Larry to sell the five-star defensive end why he needs to come play for Larry, right? Yeah. you got yeah. Hartline, who is now doesn't – was a stud player but doesn't need to sell himself. you got a great, great lineup. Um you know, Coach Alford, I mean, you got a great lineup of coaches who don't need to sell their, their capabilities or need, you know, the head coach to come along on every recruiting visit, maybe. Yeah. You know, yeah. but still, that requires that's, – that's a heavy load. Uh, and, and, you know, eventually there's got to be some pride in being a 45, 50-year-old man who's making $8 bucks, and i got to go suck up to a 15-year-old. Yeah. I mean, let's be honest, that's got to be kind of hard sometimes to – True, to true do. that. But let's face but, it, you, when you have a 23-year-old who refuse to do what you tell him to do when you're in the NFL, <laughs> that's probably even worse. Yeah, it's hard, too. You, you know it's what I'm saying? It's hard, too, for sure. Yeah. You know, particularly but, when that 23-year-old's making $20 million a year. And he's yeah, just exactly. Blowing making off. more but, than you are. Yeah. But, but I think, hey, you know, Coach, Coach yeah. Day is the man. I mean, he yeah. is the man, and that's why I'm excited. I hope we get football back this year. But as a Buckeye fan, you couldn't be more excited for the future. And – um you know, and, and what, what's in store? I mean, you know, I know I've already uh, already got the Big Ten championship game blocked off and everything else. So, you know, I'm sure that, that uh, uh, most all of us do, and we're very spoiled for, to have that. Hey, let me, let me figure this out now, right now. Is your summer home in Southern California or winter home in, in the Indianapolis area? Uh, well, so right now – I'm messing just with because, you, but go ahead. Yeah, just because of the layoff, you know, we're – yeah. We're up actually at my in-laws' place in, in Lake Tahoe for about a, a week and a half. And normally we come here around the 4th of July, but obviously now July is, is solidly booked. August is solidly booked. September is pretty much solidly booked. So we snuck up here mid-June. Um, I'm in Indy. You know, I'm in Indy a lot right now. I was, in there for the, I was there for the last month and a half. And, and I leave here in a couple of days, and I go to Indy for the next probably three to four months. So yeah. Um, and obviously, where this is going to be tricky is, is you know, my wife and I, as you know, are expecting. Yeah. And uh, so, beginning in November, and obviously, the baby, the baby will be born out in California. So, how do I and, – and right now, she can't travel as much. So, how do I balance all of this is going to be quite a challenge over the next few weeks. But, you know, like I said, I'm excited to get back racing. I think everybody is. And, you know, we kick off, uh, what, July 4th weekend on Saturday – yeah, at the Grand Prix of Indy, and then from there it's, we just hit the ground, and you can find us every single weekend. Pretty much, at almost what the weekend after we race Saturday and Sunday. The weekend after that, we do a Friday night race and a Saturday night race, so be pretty busy. Yeah, you're gonna have you're gonna have five races in the books over like three or four weeks. I mean, that's gonna be crazy. You know, I mean, yeah. five official races. Hey, real quick, uh, because I want to hit you on a couple other things because I know John Forrest doesn't let you stay on the computer long there. The, yeah right the in-laws is that the in-laws house is that what we're talking about yeah <laughs> <laughs> john force is your is your father-in-law it's still hard to imagine but i digress he cursed me out one time at at, uh, at national trail way back when he was just getting going and uh just because anyway it's a long story but he then became one of my favorite interviews you know how that works you know oh, yeah you, you, you don't go have for, to ask a question though oh yeah oh but yeah but he's oh wow but anyway Oh, we could have another uh, uh, podcast about that, but I digress. Yeah. Uh, real quick before I get to the final thing I wanted to talk to you about, uh, who is the young player or two young players on this Ohio State team that you are excited or maybe maybe they've even been playing some, you know, the last couple of years, but you're excited to see this year if they get to play possibly explode onto the scene? Well, so, I mean, obviously there's a few. Um <laughs> That's why I tried to narrow it down to one or two. Go yeah. Ahead. I'll give you – my first guy is a guy who's not necessarily young anymore. He's been, he's been there a couple of years. Um, but I don't think there's anybody more reliable than Chris Alave. I just don't. Um, soft-spoken, at least from what I've seen. Oh, yeah. 
underappreciated, undervalued on a national scope. I don't know that there's somebody that's better than him. Having said that, the young guy that I think has ridiculous capability is Garrett Wilson. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't – unbelievable capability. Um, you know, Jim, hey, Graham, I want to interrupt you, though. Just when you think, you know, like I covered Chris Carter way back when, you know what I mean? And yeah. one of the most phenomenal – I just, I mean, he would make a spectacular catch in practice every day that you'd go, you had never seen before. And you know what I mean? Then he would do that in games. Garrett Wilson is that same kind of fella. You don't know what he's capable of because he's almost capable. You get the idea of anything, right? Yeah. The catch against Clemson. I've never seen somebody like, I mean, he had to be 10 feet in the air. It's yeah, like, he was a helicopter. How, how do you jump that high? Like, I, hey, just, <laughs> Maybe his nickname ought to be the drone. You know what I mean? Oh, I mean, man. It was crazy. But then, you know, the other guy that I really hope gets his shot because I just think he deserves his shot is, is Master T. Oh, uh, yeah. I know he's banged up. I, I hope he gets healthy. I know that that running back room is stacked and it will be going forward. I get that. But he seems like a great young man who oh, yeah. just – I don't know him. I know, I, I've seen, I, he walked by me in the hallway at the Woody. That's the closest I've ever gotten to the guy. Yeah. But, you know, he just – he seems like the type of kid who just deserves a good chance to be the guy. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, he got that, – that, the great thing about them having, like, the Trey Sermon kid transfer in, maybe Marcus yeah. Crowley's coming back – it's going to be 100% is that you don't have to push Teague early like they did with Tough Borland, you know, came back from that yeah. Achilles. He wasn't right almost a whole year, you know, the whole season that year. Yeah. But, you know, because you, you're going to be yeah. tentative, you know. I mean, it's just it, human nature. And Sermon, Sermon is an absolute stud. And nobody's yeah. really talked about him much. Yeah. There's no doubt that guy's – his potential is, is sky high too, right? Yeah. I mean, he's oh, played yeah. for a couple of years or whatever, but – you know, he's got – I'm actually shocked that – and I'm sure it stings – no matter what Oklahoma says, I'm sure it stings that he left. But his potential's huge. He'll be great. And obviously, look, I've already seen all the talk about Justin Fields could be the best to ever play at Ohio State. I've never seen anybody who can run so fast that's so agile. I mean, Terrell Pryor obviously can run and do everything else. But when you look at the accuracy of the arm that Justin Fields has, I mean, it's like Haskins – yeah. Maybe even better at times, you know. And so, yeah. uh, like I said, if he can get that knee fixed up, man. Dude, dude, you want to watch something. I've talked about this on my podcast before. If you want to watch something that's cool, watch him on that pass. You brought up Chris Olave a while ago, you know, read something that really what he thought, you know, in that last play that yeah. Justin was in trouble and broke off his route. And really Justin was just buying time because he wanted to go to the clutch guy, Chris Olave. Yeah. And believe me, that was against their fourth or fifth best defensive back. That would have been a touchdown probably if you follow my drill. For sure. But my point is just watch how cool and calm under those conditions that Justin Fields appears to be in the pocket. It, you know, you don't – But that's what I mean. I, I, know, I know that's what you mean. It's, it's crazy. There, there are guys who have that, and there are clearly very talented guys who just don't have that. Yeah. You know, exactly. he's the type of guy that every time he steps back, to throw the ball, drops back, you, you, you have a feeling something great's going to happen. Yeah. Aren't a lot of guys like that, right? There are a lot of guys that drop back and you're like, oh, God, where's this going? You know, I, with him, yeah. you just don't have that feeling, and that's pretty awesome. And if that knee gets back right, then he's also got 4-3 speed to beat you to the edge anyway. So, I mean, yeah. that, you're right. I mean, that took a big weapon away from their arsenal last year at the worst time, and yet they still – should have beaten Clemson, et cetera. Oh, yeah. And and they get the core back, including, you know, Wyatt Davis and Josh Myers, those two studs in the middle of the offensive line. And uh if they are yeah. for his back, I mean, you know, you just right on and they got these young guys coming online like Nicholas Petit Freer and yeah. those guys. I mean, so that's what I want to get to here. I wanted to uh uh my final thing I wanted to ask you, you've driven I mean, with your business that you've got on the side, I don't know if it's on the side. I think you race any cars on the side, don't you? <laughs> How would you describe you? Which one's your side, your side job? Well, the performance facility is certainly my side gig. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's been a, that's been a lot of fun, too. But I have driven a lot of cool stuff. Well, past. that's what I want to get to, man. You've driven, you've driven a, almost, I would think, you'd had a chance to drive almost any 
street legal high performance car out there from McLarens to all the Porsches, uh, you yeah. know, BMWs, et cetera. So I'm going to give you three or four players. And I want you to tell me what of, of Ohio State players, what that player would be if he was a, a, a high performance street legal car. Okay. And you yeah. give me a reason why. Let's start off with the guy you do, we were just talking about, uh, Justin Fields. What would he be? I think he's a McLaren. And why do I say a McLaren? Because he's fast. You know, there's a, there's a lot of sexiness to everything that he does. But you worry a little bit about the reliability. Can he yeah. stay healthy? It's same with a McLaren. You drive a McLaren, you're a little worried every day that it might break. But you know what? When you put that, but that's the thing about him. I want to follow up on that. When you put it on the edge, reliability, you know – you're, you're well, testing not, all well, facets the of thing. the car, right? When, when everything's healthy, there's nothing more capable. Yeah. You know, it, the sky is the limit beyond even. Uh, in fact, our old race car driver, Kenny Brack, he is the test driver for McLaren. So, trust me, the capability of that product is very, very, very high. <laughs> he is, just like it is for Justin Fields. Yeah, you know Kenny Brack has found the edge in Vinson. Oh, yeah. He tested what they call the edge of the envelope. Um, Absolutely. Uh, Let's go back to a guy also you named, Master Teague III, healthy. What is he? You know, I think I find him a lot like uh, – when he's healthy, I find him a lot like a, a Porsche. Why do I say that? I think he's, he's, he's a reliable guy. You can trust him. He's steady. He might not be the fastest thing on the field, but, uh, but he's, the, he's your go-to. You know, yeah. he's going to be the guy that I think, you know, can carry. Just like J.K. was to me. He's your go-to. All right, uh, Josh Myers, the center. Uh, uh, let's put him and White Davis in the same vehicle. One of them gets to drive, one of them gets to ride. Because I, I would imagine it's not a, well, I, a super high-performance sports, sports car. car. Go ahead. Well, no, you, you. Well, it could be like a, you know, a Cayman or something. You know? but uh, no, what, no, I, you know, I don't, I, I don't, I don't know that. You know what I would say? Uh, it doesn't have to be a sports car, by the way. All right, I'm going to go with a sports car just to make okay. them feel good in case they ever see it. They are going to be like. The Ferrari Lusso. Okay, so some people probably don't know what a Lusso is, but a Lusso is a four-door Ferrari. It's a little bit bigger. It's extremely reliable. It's got nice wide hips, and it can push its way through snow, through anything that you know comes its way. So those guys are going to be my my Lusso. They're my workhorse. You know, those are the yeah. guys that got to be there every single down. Jeremy Ruckert, tight end. Ah, oh, he's a another stud. All right, um, that's a that's a tricky one. Um, we can come back to one, you know what I mean? Well, Rucker, you know, tight ends are always reliable, right? They need yeah. to be. The hands need – they got to be the most reliable. But they are not going to be the fastest guys on the field typically. Uh, let's think about this. Man, I've listed just about every sports car. So now, now i gotta, now I got to come up with a good one. I would say um, – God, I don't want to like insult him and go with like, you know, like a like a a Corvette because a Corvette is it's fast, it's reliable, but it's not it's not quite to the next level if you know it's, what I mean. It's every day. It's an everyday sports car man's car. Yeah, but I you know so I I, I guess maybe we could go with like a Z06 Corvette. Okay, so Z06 is like the level up, get a little more horsepower. Plenty, plenty capable, uh, but you can throw your golf clubs in the back and you can use it every single day. So he's got that, he's got that speed and, and the capability. But, you know, again, for him, he's definitely going to be a key part of this thing going forward. Heck yeah, man. Jonathan Cooper, you know, the guy didn't get to, didn't get to yeah. play last year, and he was primed, man. He was, you know, he was ready to have a great year, and it, uh, basically high ankle sprain ruined it. But go ahead. He's back. Yeah, let's go, let's go with uh, – Let's go with the Dodge Viper there because there you plenty, uh, you know, I, I like the aggressiveness, aggressiveness of the Viper on the, on the hood. Uh, big V10 engine, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> there's plenty of power there. I'm, I'm excited. I'm really, really, really excited to see him play. Seems, again, like I don't, I don't know him, but seems like a great guy. and It'll be good to see him back this year. Linebacker Pete Werner. I can name all those linebackers. Let's go with Pete Pete's, Werner. Pete's my man. Pete's an Indiana boy. Right. Indianapolis. Uh, in fact, I saw Pete's sister just uh, she's married to a, a friend of mine. Uh, I've actually uh, I've, I've met Pete's dad a couple times. Never met him in, in person, but really? he and I communicated yeah. a little bit. But um, yeah, I mean, I think you know Pete is is as hard hitting as you're going to ever find. So 
he packs a punch probably, you know, a little bit more like a, uh, he's, he's not going to be your sports car, but I think, you know, he's got, uh, what's a, let's he's going to be like, people aren't going to even know what this is, but he's like a Jeep SRT eight track Hawk. Wow. And if you know what that is, that's like a 750 horsepower Jeep. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So that thing's got some serious power, but it, it'll hit you hard. Four wheel yeah. drive and the whole deal. I mean, Pete's got, he's, he's, he's a loaded gun there. I love it. All right. Last one. Uh, cause we could name all these guys. Cause you'd have a guy, you'd have a car for him. Um, cause we're not going into the mini Cooper realm or anything like wow. that with these guys. Uh, Sean Wade. I mean, obviously, uh, and I, I want you to talk, I want you to incorporate this thought into it. This guy could have gone pro and nobody would have questioned it. You know, I mean, no, I know. Sean, Sean Wade, I think to me is at the peak of athleticism. Like, uh, you know, to me, I think he's, uh, you know, he for sure is, is your, is your Ferrari, your V12 Ferrari, you know, just yeah. actually, no, no, I'm not going to say V12. He's like a 488 Pista. And what do I mean by that? 488 Pista is a 700, 800 horsepower, uh, rear wheel, a rear engine, mid engine, uh, rear wheel drive car, extremely agile, extremely quick on its feet but it absolutely flies. So that's going to be Sean Wade. Sean Wade's the guy I'm probably most, you know, I, he, he would, he's got to be the guy I'm most excited to see play this year. Did you see how cunning he was? Cunning he was on that blitz when he just broke free? I mean, yeah. you talk about putting it all together, and it was going to be the play. It was going to be the play that literally turned the game, correct? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it flipped. It, it did flip the game, but the other way. Yeah. Know? And it was amazing. I mean, it was talk about as timely a moment as there was. Oh, yeah. That was it. Because at that point, Trevor Lawrence seriously didn't know what had hit him. Those yeah. guys were lost. Yeah. They were lost. Yeah. The other things, I mean, if J.K., you know, J, J.K. catches the ball, it goes in the end zone. Right. I mean, he go. broke the plane with the ball. Okay, I get you got to go down with it, but all right. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, and then couple of those other big runs he breaks through and, and and they get in there i mean that thing becomes a blowout in that scenario but uh yeah it did go the opposite way but I, I gotta hope that you know like me in a race where you know things are going my way and then bam it goes wrong and you know and ruins my day you got to use that to inspire you and push forward so hopefully for for next year we're going to see something uh special from him ladies and gentlemen this is an example of why uh, uh graham's uh very, very capable uh, public relations specialist, Kathy Lauterbach, never liked to see me show up uh, when Graham was giving interviews because he and I occasionally would just start talking about our state football, <laughs> which would make everybody else mad. They want to know, what are you thinking on the start line at Indy? Yeah. Well, yeah. same thing I was thinking last year. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, yeah, it's different. But, you know, obviously it's fun for me to get away from the racing yeah. stuff sometimes. We can talk about that all day, and racing is clearly – the forefront of my mind and my family and our lives. Uh, but you know, when, when racing is done, there's nothing I enjoy, uh, you know, with the season, I mean, and we get yes. into the fall, there's nothing more that I enjoy than, uh, sitting down and, and watching an Ohio state game. I literally live, you know, for that, uh, each and every weekend. And so, uh, Grant, really yeah. ask you this. So is it, is it more exciting than ever though, to watch an Ohio state game, knowing, knowing that they not only have capability on offense, but they, but they use it. You understand what well, I'm saying? That's the key. That's the thing is they're using the capability they have. Yeah. The firepower is unbelievable, but we've always had firepower and sometimes right. it's just faltered. You know, the firepower is ridiculous. And also with Madison and everything else, the defense is fun. The defense has always had the talent, but we saw a couple years ago, the defense was bad. Yes. You know, honestly, it was just a shootout every game. So it's fun for me to see both sides, you know, playing well. Uh, gotcha. The other thing that's fun is to see these young guys go from a four or five star or a three star recruit and truly develop to their potential and go on to the NFL. There's a lot of teams you get five star recruits that cannot convert and move them on. And so that's been cool to see with Coach Meyer and obviously Coach Day already. Gotcha. Well, hey, uh, you know, you need to put that Ohio State replica helmet up back on because I remember when you won at Mid-Ohio, that was definitely a good luck charm for you. And uh, I know it's probably a keepsake. You, heck, I don't know. You may have sold it by now. but uh, you No, know, no, uh, it's in my office. You might have <laughs> been part of Tatgate, you know, for all I know. You know, but, uh, oh, I got two of them. <laughs> I know, man, I know. But, hey, Graham, man, I appreciate you coming on, my man. We'll yeah, thank you. We'll on later on in the season when things are going on, and we'll see what you're thinking about then. You know, this is going to be – 
a crazy fall because you could have college football, IndyCar racing, NHL, NBA, NFL, all going on at once trying to get you to watch them. Yeah, once sports uh, get back going. Right now, IndyCar racing is just about the only thing. Obviously, yeah. NASCAR as well. But racing in general is about the only thing going. Yeah. But once, uh, once, uh, once this thing turns the corner, uh, it's going to be it's going to be pretty busy. So uh, obviously, we got golf coming into Columbus here soon with the Memorial. Uh, I'm, I'm bummed to not. I'm not going to be there this year with, with Nationwide as I was last year. Um, yeah. With the pro am, they've changed the way the pro am works. But I'm excited to go back next year. But it's always. You know, it's been a lot of fun uh, to uh, to get back racing and hopefully keep this thing going strong. Hey, until next time, Graham, thanks for coming on the Tim May Podcast, my man. Thanks, Tim. And we're back, ladies and gentlemen. I, I promised you that was going to be an interesting conversation with uh, Graham Rayall. And uh, when I got him to start equating uh, football players on the high state team with, with street legal uh, high-performance sports cars, he's actually driven in the past. It was pretty interesting, especially right off the bat. He compared Justin Fields to a McLaren, you know, and McLaren, in my opinion, is a creme de la creme, a little bit of a high-maintenance vehicle. But, man, when it's all on, it's, it, it can't be touched. Well, I, don't, I think the good news for Ryan Day is that Justin Fields is not that high-maintenance. Uh, even, even when he's got something bugging him a little bit, like the knee did late last year, he still fought through it, you know, hated the – I don't know if there's a, a comparable for the knee brace that he put on for a car, but uh, – you know, he, he – we had a bum wheel, and he still kept rolling and still kept the Ohio State offense on track for that Big Ten title. But, yeah, I, I agree. If you're talking yeah, – He about, didn't mean it. He didn't mean it as a slam, man. No, no, no. In fact, that, that – that, but, but, you know, the, the funny thing is putting that brace on was kind of like putting on one of those mini spares, you know, in the back, yeah. you know, after you've got these grippy, grippy uh, high-performance tires. Uh, so, they did take a little bit away from his game. But, no, you're right. I mean, he thinks Justin Fields is as good as those – almost ever been. I mean, you know, when you just look at what he showed last year and what's coming, you, you have that sense too, don't you, Boston? Yeah, and when he, you know, I'd been watching some of those, you know, uh, photos and videos of him working out down in Georgia and what he was doing with Quincy Avery and those folks down there, and you just saw it. It was like, man, well, that's a little different. Like, he was looking huge, like so much more muscular than he was a year ago, and that's one of the things, yeah, you know, that we had talked about before with, a guy now going into his third year of college and uh, you know, it, it, the physical maturity, you know, you're not going to have that at 18, 19. You st- he starts becoming a real full grown man with Mickey Marotti in the strength program. Even if he's not here, which he wasn't for the last couple months, you know what to do, uh, you know, what to eat, how to take the next step and still getting in your workouts. And, you know, I don't know exactly what, you know, weights he had available to him, but, Certainly, if he's working out with Quincy Avery and that crew, he probably had everything he really needed. And the way he came back, just like, I know this sounds silly because I've been talking about, you know, the guys that we saw the day that the Woody was open. Yeah. But, you know, he physically looked different than he did last year. And part of that with the knee, and we talked about the injury last year, well, he's going to be better equipped to take some hits. He's going to be better equipped to stay, you know, luck. Injury is, is luck, too. We know that, you know, sometimes it's a fluke deal. It's non-contact. But just the next step for him being, you know, more physically prepared as a runner, standing in the pocket, you know, how, how that could translate to him. The arm strength was already there. We already knew we could run. Uh, but that's sort of the next, next phase for him. And he was one of those guys when you walked in, it was like, whoa, it kind of caught your eye with how, how impressive he looked physically. Yeah, people forget, you know, he weighed 225, two, you know, in the 220s last year at quarterback. He is a stout – he is a big individual who happens to be 4.3 4. <laughs> second speed and with a great arm. I mean, you know, I told you coming out of the spring a year ago, my concern was him as a passer because it just, you know, the – Either thing, things weren't syncing up right. Even on that long touchdown pass he threw to what Benjamin Victor in that spring game, you go, well, Victor had to stop. You know, I mean, it wasn't a perfectly <laughs> thrown pass. You follow my He just got, I mean, as I've described it many times on this podcast, he's just got better and better, almost with every possession, much less every game, uh, much less every week. You know, and uh, that's what impressed me about him because he was finally the guy. Yeah. Uh, he got on sync with his receivers. And that's why it was just a shame, like uh, Graham and I talked about on, you know, when I was talking to him, the shame that uh, that last pass he threw last year, he and Chris Olave had been on the same page forever through the year, and they weren't on that particular play, and that was that. But uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think yeah, Justin Fields being installed as the Heisman Trophy favorite in some betting lines is, is, the, is proper. You agree? Yeah, and there's not a lot of money to be made betting on the favorite here, and it's such a you know, hard thing to actually go out and be the Heisman favorite and go wire to wire. But yeah. I just can't imagine if, if he stays healthy uh, with all of the weapons around him and that offensive line and then him being healthy. I mean, he was still so effective in those last few games, even when, he, even when the knee was clearly bothering him. I know that, you know, the, he, he missed on a few throws, uh, and certainly against Clemson. There were times I thought that, you know, if he's fully healthy, well, this would have been available as a rusher. He had the one interception, you know, towards that sideline earlier in the game that was a little bit out of character for him to be behind and uh, and not read that coverage right. But, you know, we're nitpicking this guy who threw three picks and had 175 touchdowns, it felt like, and, you know, beats, beats Michigan on a bum leg, goes through a war to get through the Big Ten championship game and all that. I mean, he... He is special, and he's going to have – the schedule might get changed. I'm sure we're going to talk about that here in a couple minutes. Yeah. Um, and who knows how many, you know, games everyone will play or should play. But um, if he had a full season, I think the things that he could do, you know, even last year, if he got to play some more of those second halves, his numbers would have blown Joe Burrow out of the water. Oh, yeah. I think that he would have been a legitimate Heisman winner last year. So I'm not – I would certainly not bet any money on another on a player to beat Justin Fields out. Unbelievable the years, the seasons that Justin Fields and J.K. Dobbins had, and unbelievable the seasons they could have had <laughs> if they'd stayed in the second halves of more than half of those games when the picking was good. You know what I mean? I mean, the fruit was hanging low from the tree. And, uh, yeah, it, it is amazing. Uh, but then again, I think, you know, that's what Graham and I were talking about, man. This is the, what sets these teams apart now. We're going to get into this on a later podcast. But what sets these teams apart now and what makes fans like Graham get excited is Ohio State under Urban Meyer especially and now uh, uh, Ryan Day, they not only have the weapons, but they use them. I mean, they are not timid to play offense. And you're seeing the fruition of it. You know, I mean, it's just amazing just – how much more? I mean, we're going to talk about this in next week's podcast because this, this will take 45 minutes. But the potential of this coming offense compared to even last year can kind of blow your mind when you really think about weapons coming online and then the backup weapons should those weapons uh, f- falter or fail. Agreed? Yeah. I, I know you don't want to spend 45 minutes on it, but like, we've just been talking about that <clears throat> as, as far as offensive line week. I had Corey Lindsley – uh, in uh, to our show Letterman Live on Monday. And it's like, well, here's what's different, you know, from 2012 to 13 or some of these other great offenses. Like, yeah, if, if for a lot of years, and even re- as recently as maybe two or three years ago on the offensive line, just in particular, one guy gets hurt and the whole thing collapses. That's not the case anymore for Ohio State on that in that group. And that was the case at linebacker for a while. Right. Um, you know, wide receiver there was a stretch where it was pretty dicey with the depth but right now you're like we're talking about Nicholas Petit Frere and Paris Johnson and Dewan Jones like a three-man battle for one spot he, he got there Munford over there but look at guard you have Wyatt Davis in there locked in you know you have Josh Myers at center and then you have you know elite recruit Harry Miller five-star you know Luke <laughs> Whipler coming in as four or five-star depending on where you're looking and Enoch Vamahi, you know, not going on the mission. Like, all of these guys could not only play elsewhere, they'd be starting. Harry Miller could have been a starter as a freshman at almost any other school yep. uh, in the country. And and now that's the way – like, it, the depth is just absolutely insane. I, that's, I don't know any other way to say it. Yeah, you can't launch the SpaceX or the uh, uh, Saturn V without the launch pad, as I always say about the offensive line. So you're exactly right. Hey, let's move on to something real quick. Uh, I, I tweeted over the weekend because, you know, you were seeing all these reports about Clemson with 23 players, or at least maybe in quarantine, but uh, they're yep. worried about uh, uh, LSU. Um, uh, Texas has had its problems. Uh, UCLA's got problems of a different matter. <laughs> But, uh, you know, Martin Germain, welcome to the big time, you know, athletic director at LSU. I mean, at UCLA, I always like to be dealing with that situation. But uh, quite a few teams have had problems with it. And it, it is knock on wood for Ohio State that uh, at least through the weekend, they had not had a, an occurrence of COVID-19 on their, uh, in their football 
program area. Uh, to think that that's going to continue to be the case, I think would be dreaming a little bit, you know, but Ohio State, the way I understand it, uh, what was explained to me by a couple of the insiders I was talking to is they're going overboard enforcing the, except when you're on the field, the wear the mask situation. Uh, they're going overboard about the social distancing. Forget about six feet. They're talking about 10 or 12 feet because you only have nine guys. You know, you don't have to be that close, you know. Uh, right on down the line, they're very adamant. Uh, we all know the pledge they signed, and everybody got all worked up about the pledge. The pledge was not meant to be a legal document the way I understand it at all. It was just meant to reinforce the fact that you understood what was expected of you, what you should expect from Ohio State and the, the guys that run the Woody Hayes Athletic Center, et cetera. Your signature means that you actually read it, you know. And uh, uh, <laughs> so that's what that was all about. And I think a lot of people really took that and ran with it and really didn't just call one person and find out what's up, right? I mean, it, Gene's it pretty- idea, I do believe, was just to make sure everybody – understood what their responsibility was but you know that doesn't necessarily turn into a a legal document because of that but uh, I thought it was I thought it was interesting because you know now these guys know all know they're beholding to each other that's the pledge they took is don't go out on the weekends if you can help it that's where the big uh, the big scare is right now. And I know, you know, you're going to talk about that in a second, but that's their biggest worry now is on Mondays and Tuesdays after these guys have had the weekend off, well, you know, where did they go, who did they see, et cetera. So, uh, but go ahead. Yeah, Monday through Friday, I mean, Ohio State and, and all these schools, even the ones that have had outbreaks, they're really try- they're doing everything they possibly can. When it comes to the pledge itself, as you said, it wasn't that hard to get in touch with somebody who, who – you know, put that out for the football program at Ohio State and clarify the situation. I thought the reporting, some of that was pretty uh, reckless or needless. Or Sensational. Sensationalist. Yeah. Um, anyway, I'm not here to uh, to debate over that because you covered it well. But, yeah, the, the concern is, and this happened over the weekend with Kansas State, where players – was not in the facility, but they went out to a party, and then when you come back, well, then you're still in this proximity. Like, it's not going to be possible, no matter how much you clean a weight room, no matter how much you, uh, you know, separate guys during workouts, they're going to be sweating and working out closely enough that if somebody gets it, it's going to spread. I think yeah. we, have to, we have to stop pretending like that's not going to be the case. Not that you and I are, but if you think that, you know, there's going to be one dude on a team and then no one else is going to get it, that's not going to happen. Uh, Clemson is the most clear example of that that exists with, uh, you know, as you said, 23, and I think two staffers on top of that. Um, you know, that's what's going to happen because you have meet, positional meetings. Um, they're going to be playing football again at some point in this scenario. They're going to be hitting and, and sweating and, you know, coughing and whatever else around each other. It's going to spread. That's just yeah. the way that this thing works. So the biggest part of the Buckeye Pledge or others is that here's the protocol – if there's a positive test now like this weekend was really demoralizing as somebody who has been on this your show since March and weighing the progress and this step was important and that step was important and it was all towards football I think over the weekend was a real reality check for Mm -hmm. Texas LSU Kansas State Clemson Houston had already had it you know there are other Alabama's dealt with it Alabama UCLA um that this is a there everybody knows that there are going to be positive tests and I think they're moving forward as if well how can you mitigate it and and handle it responsibly you know we're I don't know that there is a way to do that no there isn't I mean to do it completely and and to to feel 100 percent confident there is no way to do that until like I said until a vaccine comes along that's what you're kind of the the jeopardy you're going to be facing and then you know top of it but what you know it's a reality check also like is what, and I know this is what you meant. Is there going to be college football this coming season? Uh, that's the reality check. Is just when people are feeling a little bit confident, coming out of the woods, so to speak. Uh, you know, this hits you, and it can it can flare up again and again. You know, until 
there is a, a way found to uh, stop it from spreading from the sense of uh, people having a vaccine. And people that don't understand that, I mean, you still go in stores now and you'll see, unless it's mandated by that store, you'll see people not wearing masks. And I just go, like Graham and I talked about, the, the mask is you protecting the guy across from you, not the mask protecting you from that guy. So you owe it as a, as a human being, as an individual, because you don't know whether you've got it asymptomatically or not. You know, you owe it to, that, to the people you're coming in contact with to be wearing a mask at this time. It's not asking very much. Yeah, and, and so I think that's part of it. Like these guys, when they're going to be playing, they're, you can't wear a mask and play football. And there was, a, you know, lots of, you know, Chase Young was one of the players that was mocking the, you know, full-headed helmet that looked like a NASCAR helmet. Yeah. You know, maybe Graham Rahal would wear it. Space you know, helmet. Whoever, whoever made this design that the NFL players could possibly wear, and they're like, well, you've never played football if you think that you could wear this and it would work. And it wouldn't. There's no way that uh, that, that would possibly happen. So, um, you know, you're going to be exposed. They're going to be spreading uh, when they play football. That's that's just the case. And I know that some some people are not, you know, not worried because uh, these guys are young and they're in the best shape of their life and – it's not. It's gonna probably not kill any college football players, but that's really not the issue. And I think when you're looking at the NCAA as an entire governing body, the thing that they're gonna have a really tough time with is it, it doesn't matter if it's football necessarily uh, or contact sports. You're playing a volleyball. You know, volleyball. They're all gonna be in a tight space. They might not be physically hitting each other but you're going to be breathing and sweating oh yeah oh yeah yeah that's just part of it so now the ncaa is talking and looking at it as college football they they're they're in charge of everything you know golf hey that's going to be easy i have you know you and i are both still playing golf it's easy to social you know social distance but especially where i hit it but go ahead (laughs) that's not the case you know for this for football and so you have to have a plan in place for when the positives come but that plan might include that you need to forfeit games or cancel games because if Clemson had the same thing happen in two months uh, or in the middle of October, you cannot play a game with missing 23 of your players. That would, that would put everybody in jeopardy. Um, you know, from the yeah. physical, from a standpoint of getting players hurt or having freshmen on the field against, you know, teams that are fully ready. If they play Notre Dame missing 23 guys, that, no, that game will not happen. And I think that's – this, for me, I, I've felt – and you and I have talked about this, that that 10-game conference-only schedule was in, you know, gaining momentum and it was in yep. the works. And I'm like, okay, well, that's what's going to happen and they'll manage it and everybody will get through it. But I still think that that's where they go. Here's, here's the thing, Boston. I want to, to say this. You know, like I, I always say this, I'm, I'm not beating my own – my blowing my own horn here, but uh, beating my own drum. But uh, you know, I wrote about that two and a half, three months ago, and because that to me is the most feasible way of doing it. And I think the closer you get to this, that's what's going to happen. Don't you? Don't you get that sense? Yeah, I think that when I when I keep saying it's demoralizing or it was a warning signal or panic or whatever, I think this is the weekend where that will tip it over. It's been trending this way for a long time, as you said. You wrote about it, and you and I have both heard that as an option the entirety of the last three months. Yeah. We know that that's something that's under consideration, but I think this weekend is a, a reminder that if they're going to have college football, and I, and I sure hope that we do, and you schedule a 10 game big 10 only schedule or a 10 game sec schedule or wherever, that's still not guarantee that you're going to play all 10 games because this is going to be the wild west in terms of having to make it up as you go, because yeah. there's no, there's no, you know, protocol for reporting. If you have a positive test, you and I, like Ohio State didn't confirm it. Clemson did. Um, you know, you and I have both talked to multiple people who said that the numbers are zero for Ohio State. But let's say you get into the week of the, you know, week of yeah. uh, whoever, you know. any Not how many's got it. Who's got availability it. Availability report yeah. and suddenly you have 35 names on it. Yeah. So that's the day before a game. You have to have something in place just to handle, you know, the roster – and who's going to travel, and if you're going to travel, and I think well, here's the thing: I think if they go to a ten game season, uh, you could you could theoretically work in give everybody three off weeks. I mean, three bye weeks, whatever you you know, they're off weeks, not bye weeks. Yeah, three off weeks, where if in fact you do have a 
sort of a, a breakout uh, within your team, et cetera, it would give you a little bit more of a fighting chance to maybe get some of those guys back, et cetera, you know. But it's always dependent on how – how you test going into it and how you test coming out of it, you know. But, uh, but, uh, but you could be really lenient. Maybe you don't need for the first time in a long time, maybe you don't need a conference championship game at the end of it all. You know, maybe you do just go right into like a uh, – maybe a bowl season if you can make it happen, but uh, go right into the semifinals of the college football playoff three or four weeks after the season is over. You know, there are all kinds of ways for one year that you can get this done, correct? Yeah, and I think that, you know, I, this is the most doom doom and gloom I've sounded in a while. I know that. But I think that this this was maybe a needed wake-up call for some yes. of the realities that they're going to have to face because um, there's going to be games that are forfeited. There are going to be cancellations um, even within the Big Ten. You know, you look at where Rutgers is in their situation. You know, even just in terms of buying enough testing, they're not on the same footing as Ohio State. Correct. So that's, that puts you in a completely different ballpark right there. Uh, we've talked about leaving, you know, if, if Rutgers gets left behind or whatever. You know, it might not be their choice, obviously, they might, but they might wind up canceling or forfeiting six games if they have a breakout. And I'm, I, I always hate to pick on Rutgers specifically, but the part of their country and in the Big Ten footprint, they're probably the, the place that's most at risk yeah. at this moment. Um, and probably Maryland and Northwestern after that, don't you figure? I yeah, mean, so yeah. – you know, all of this is going to – Minnesota. Have, and that's why we've, we've, we've kept saying July, July, July. They need more information. Well, this is part of the reason why they didn't make any decisions until yeah. now because this the, – the voluntary workouts and getting back on campus was a, essentially turning into a test case to see if you could even manage having guys in the facility. They're not even back to having 22 guys run a, run a drill with 11 on offense and 11 on defense – or tackling each other, and they're already dealing with this stuff. And maybe, maybe in three weeks, they'll look back at this and 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 say, well, you know, this this didn't matter, or the a quarantine time didn't need to be 14 days. I think some schools have already said, or some studies have said it's down to 10. And yeah, you know, I, all that stuff. I, I'm trying to you know read about it the same way as anybody else because I'm not. That's not my profession, but right. Um, you know, they, they still have a couple weeks here where they have to seriously look down and say, what can we manage? What do we need to build in? You know, what's the, what's the way to get through this? Because they, they really do not want to put canceling the entire season on the table. No. But Here, here's the thing, like, like, like Gene Smith was basically alluding to several weeks ago, uh, this is real, the reopening and letting people come back to Woody Hayes nine at a time and work out with a, an instructor. Uh, was the beginning of the beginning, you know, yeah. it wasn't even. And so people were, you know, people were asking for definitive answers. Like you're talking, oh, how many games you're going to play, blah, blah, blah. You know, the, the, you don't know. I mean, like he said, you know, people don't want to wait, you know, as you well know, he's one of the movers and shakers in major college sports. And even he said, you know, by early mid July, probably early July, that's when you got to start coming up with things. And like you and I've talked about so many times on this podcast in the last three months, two weeks, is a long period in this whole deal. Two weeks can tell you whether or not there is a second wave coming or a major problem with opening uh, camps, like Major League Baseball has found out, you know. Uh, maybe the NFL is finding out. Uh, it, 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 two weeks can tell you whether you're on the right track or not and uh, whether you can have things under control. Uh, and I'm talking about two weeks from now to, you know, the to the middle of early second week of July. So uh, uh, that's two or three weeks. People don't want to wait that long. They want the answers now, and the answers aren't going to come now. And I, I feel sorry for everybody that thinks they can because there, there are no soothsayers out there in this regard. Yeah, and I think that even when they do set that schedule, and we'll see if we're, we're right about what they could or should do, that still is not going to be, you know, definite. People are going right. to have to be flexible with this. They're going to have to prepare for situations where team team can't travel, teams, you know, the national champion this year might just be whoever stays the healthiest and gets lucky that they avoid an outbreak. I mean, that's just the right. reality. 2020 is going to be um, completely unique in the modern college football era. It's right. going to be different. It's going to require patience. And um, it always was going to be. Yeah. But that's, that's what... just, that's just, you know, to pull it off because everyone is going to have to be creative and pull together. 
And, and as you said, one way to do that now, you look at the places that are wearing masks. I mean, hey, Michigan and Ohio are doing pretty well. I think yeah. they, they wanted football in Big Ten country here. Yeah. But we could yeah. also probably do better. Exactly. Hey, real quick before we go, because we've run out of time here, man. Uh, the, the hourglass has very little sand left in it. Matter of fact, I think I've already flipped it once. Um, <laughs> Alabama, yeah, versus, Alabama versus Ohio State, the regular season, uh, 2027. Uh, Alabama at uh, Ohio State at Alabama, two th- regular season, 2028. I mean, oh, my God. It was like – that news that came down last week was like, you know, I don't know, like stock market news or something. And it was, it's seven years from now. I'll be well into my 70s at that point. You'll be well into your 30s at that point, right? Hey, hey. Well, huh? Next hey. decade after that. I know. I'm just trying to say how youthful you look. Yeah, uh, I, don't, I don't want to talk about that yet. Come on. But here's the thing. is, uh, is I, uh, I use this analogy with Ryan Day during recruiting, you know, about – it's not me, you know, the uh, Jerry Seinfeld. He'd actually seen that episode, which, boy, don't tell me a lot about Ryan Day right there that I, that I liked, you know. But, uh, you know, like the old uh, uh, rental car thing, it's not taking the reservation, it's holding it. Anybody can take a reservation, but it's the holding the reservation that's the essence of it. Um, what's the likelihood of uh, uh, Alabama, Ohio State 2027 and 2028 actually happening? What do you think? I think it's probably around 80%. What do you think? I think they want the likelihood to be higher than that, which is why they built in that $3 million cancellation fee yeah. there. And that's the, as I, I talked to Diana Sable right away, uh, whatever day that was Thursday, uh, they're all still all running together for me. Yeah. Um, Doesn't you know, matter. Last week, go ahead. Yeah. And, and she, like, I didn't have a copy of the contract. It just kind of came out and I, and I reached out because it was a big deal. And I'm not sure that Ohio state, you know, everybody there realized right away how important and historic that series could and could be. And she just kind of, I said, was there anything else like that you I need to know about this or that you think is important? And she's like, yeah, like, it's going to happen. You know, this is the highest uh, cancellation fee that Ohio State has ever agreed to, the $3 million. Yeah. So, you know, and, and I'm not saying that that amount cannot be paid by either school because there have been plenty of other contracts that ESPN – has helped break in order to stage a neutral site game. And Alabama has been part of that. Uh, you know, Ohio State you know, played the one with TCU that wasn't really scheduled that way in Dallas a couple years right, ago. It was going to be a home and home. Yeah. yeah. So, so those things can happen. But I think that – I really think that there's been a shift that the teams want these games to be on campus away from the neutral site games. And part of that is driven by TV revenue. Mm-hmm. I think uh, a, a maybe, a, maybe a bigger part of that. And they also, they're fighting this attendance problem. This was, you know, pre, pre-COVID, getting oh, yeah. people to come to the stadiums. Let me interrupt. I actually had a podcast about that. I had Dennis Dodd on. We were just discussing right. that very thing, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah. And so you've talked about that. It was long before any of this happened, that, you know, TVs and, and drinking your own beer and having the bathroom readily available. You know, <laughs> there's, no, there's no way to fight back against that unless you're selling an experience Ohio State, Alabama, that is extremely rare and that you, people are going to fight tooth and nail to go see uh, because of the pure history over a matchup like that. So I think, you know, 80% is probably fair. I, I would tend to go a little bit higher than that because of, A, because of the, the buyout, um, B, because I think that, you know, both of these athletic directors understand that schools are going to have to start making more money. And Ohio State and Alabama, they make their most amount of money by having fans come out there and athletic departments are really going to be hurting this year because they're not going to be fans uh, or that's going to be extremely limited. Yep. So you're not going to have the, your concessions. You're not going to have your ticket sales, your parking, selling, you know, t-shirts, all that stuff is going to be going away this year and maybe even next year. You're going to be trying in 2027, you're going to be trying to still make up some of the shortfall without a doubt. into in 2020. There is no doubt about it. I'm talking about the big time schools, much less some of the, you know, the smaller time schools, and you're exactly right. And, the, you know, the thing is, I've, I've uh, been to the previous four Alabama games with Ohio State. Uh, one I attended just as a fan, the Sugar Bowl back in 78, uh, uh, when uh, the only Woody Hayes, Bear Bryant confrontation ever, which is a shame, you know, you know, uh, really. And, uh, but the other three games, uh, uh, 
the kickoff classic in uh, in uh, in the Meadowlands in 1986, the uh, bowl game, the Fiesta, the uh, Citrus Bowl after the '94 season, and then of course the uh, the game in New Orleans, which is one of the great. Those three games have all been great games. Absolutely. I mean, it was great, and and the fervor it built, you know, the must watch TV moments. Those were were crazy. And what's really funny about all four of those is there were four different sets of head coaches for each of them. You know what I mean? Yeah. So here's my last question to you. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, Ryan Day and uh, Debo Sweeney, of course, met, you know, uh, unceremoniously last year in the, in the uh, festival, which, yeah. from which Ohio State had it pulled from its grasp by the officials, uh, uh, as Graham Rowell and I talked about. But, uh, again – what, who will be the head coaches for Ohio State and Clemson? Or, excuse me, Ohio – there was a little flip. There was a little yeah. Freudian there. Ohio <laughs> State and Alabama in 2027. Yeah, I, I, I just can't shake this feeling that Dabo won't ever leave Clemson, you know, for another spot in college football. I don't really see him as a successful NFL coach, but I bet if he leaves it wouldn't be to try and duplicate – his success or Nick Saban's success at Alabama. That just seems like a, a pretty big risk for his legacy to do that. So I don't. He's, so what's your he's, answer? So you're, like you're, a, you're, 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 sitting, you're, you're thinking, data. you're thinking while you're talking out loud, you're thinking of an answer. Now, what's your trying, answer? I was buying a little, a little time talking too much about Dabo, but I think my point is that he wouldn't be it. And I don't know. I mean, Nick Saban is, he just like, He's older than me. He he doesn't seem to yeah have Age. any interest in retirement, like like you as well. We can't, uh, you know. He seems I don't know that he's ever going to quit. He might he might be there for the next thirty years. He like just can't get it out. But you know what? I, they're going to play. The, the, the thing about a, I think Ohio State and Alabama are going to play, maybe a couple of three times before that game. <laughs> yeah, you you follow my drift? Yeah. I mean, so this idea that Nick Saban's got to play Ohio State again to set the record straight, well, that might, that might come that this happened. year, might come next year, you know. So, uh, so you're not giving me an answer is what you're saying. Okay. I, I think I Dabo will, Sweeney has a great chance of being there. That's what my answer is, but go ahead now. Yeah, I, I don't think that um, Dabo will be there. I don't think that Nick Saban will be there either. Uh, I'm trying to think who else would, would be on the, the coaching tree ready for that kind of move. I think it'd be easier if Kirby Smart stays on this trend for Alabama to take him from Georgia. Um, wow. That'd be a hell of a – that would be an interesting hire if you know anything about Alabama. But but go well, ahead. You know, here's – all right, I've bought myself enough time. I'm with time. you. I'm with you on that one. I, I've bought myself enough time. If Al, if Alabama loses Nick Saban, they will, they will back up a Brinks truck to Norman, Oklahoma. To, they will pay Lincoln Riley whatever he asks. I think that would be the way forward for them is that they've got to pluck it uh, from somewhere else because I don't because like I said I don't think Dabo would go there. So I think we'll have we'd have a Lincoln Riley matchup, and I think you know Ryan Day eventually if he if he stays winning at this level, I do believe that he would try to go you know to the next level in the NFL. I, I think he's got that in him at some point. In which case we'd be talking about. Uh, potential Ohio State head coach Luke Fickle or Brian Hartline. And if 2027, I think my money would be on Luke Fickle against Lincoln Riley. Just They're going to flip the roles, right? Nick Saban, defensive yeah. coach against Ryan Day, offensive coach, and then they go the opposite way. I, I know I that think, that's not the actual scenario, but that's the best I can come up with. You know, I think I, I disagree with a lot of people. I think Ryan Day likes where he is. I think he likes what's building. Uh, I think he is cut out to be a major college head coach for for a long time. That's what I think. Uh, I'm talking about a lot of people keep talking about him maybe having pro aspirations. The pros, like I've explained to people a lot of times, man, you can be the greatest coach ever seen in college football, but when you get to the NFL, you are a disposable diaper <laughs> because you look really good and tight when they put – when they, you know, when it's first secured – but as soon as the you-know-what comes down, they take you off, fold you up, and throw you away. And that's what they do. I don't care who you are. 
in the NFL. And look at all the fairly successful college coaches with a few exceptions, you know, who have had it, who have had it done to them that way. Pete Carroll was kind of getting out of town, you know, ahead of the posse when he right. went to Seattle, but that was his second stint, you know, uh, right on down the line. We, we, you know, we know Lou Holtz, we, you know, Nick Saban, uh, right on down the line, the guys that have gone and, and not, uh, you know, uh, the old ball Spurrier. coach, you know, from Florida. Yeah. Spurrier. I mean, a lot of these guys have great ideas, but it doesn't necessarily translate. And a lot of people like Graham was talking about, you know, well, that, then you just get to be a, a football coach, but yeah, you get to be a football coach where the only real goal is, did you win the Super Bowl? And three years later, or sometimes a year later, they don't think you've got what it takes for whatever reason, change of ownership, change of general manager. Uh, your two best players decide they don't like you and won't play for you. Yeah. You know, they're making more money than you are, even though you're making great money. I don't know. I, th I think Ryan Day, I think he seems very comfortable where he is right now. Yeah, I, I completely agree with all that. And you and I think I as long as RJ, I think as long as his son, you know. Well, that's a big influence, right? I mean, Exactly. His, his family. He moved them all over the country. Go ahead his now. His family loves it here. They have no I, – I, I didn't mean that to sound as if he was looking to leave or had any – I know. I know what you meant. Because yeah. you and I have both had that conversation with him before, and I, I do believe that he's genuine when he talks about wanting to be in it, um, and especially in Ohio State for the long haul. Uh, when you talk about Ryan and Nina and those kids, they, they do love it. Um, yeah. And that's a big part of it. But, you know, and it's always just it, easier to say that, before, you know, five, where are you going to be in five years? Well, you know, what you might want to do then is different when the kids, you know, grow up and get older and maybe move out of the house. That's still a long way for some of the younger ones in that house. But, you know, you never really know what it is that's going to push you to do something. Right. And I think that Ryan Day could win a couple national championships in the meantime. And that, that can be – when you do reach that summit, that might change your goals. And I, I think that that's likely for him because I don't see the, the program slipping or sliding, regressing at all. Yeah. And, you know, he's going to get a lot more of the credit for it as it continues to get further away from the Urban Meyer era. And he deserves it. He's a really bright, really bright offensive mind, and he relates well to all people, especially his players, but even communicating with us. He's on another level. And so there, I just think there will be people that try every single year. And sometimes it just clicks. Like, that's the one that you want. And if somebody asks enough, you might think, all right, I, let's see if I'm really this good or not. And, yeah. Yeah. you know, if, you, if he says no seven or eight times, hey, you just tip your hat and you know that Gene Smith got the right guy uh, who never had any interest in actually going to the NFL. Well, Zill, you know, the uh... – the guys you give it up to, as I like to say, in mountain climbing, isn't Sir Edmund Hillary. It's his uh, Tenzing Norgay or whatever his uh, Sherpa guide was because he probably went up Everest ten times. <laughs> you know, who knows? I mean, the, the continually climbing Everest and sort of like staying there for one of another term is the hardest thing you do in sport, especially in football and especially in college football where your team – uh, changes wholesale sometimes from one year to the next. And uh, that can wear on any man, but it also wears on you in the National Football League because 32 teams, you know, and, uh, you know, just only one team gets to win the Super Bowl every year, and uh, that's how you're judged. And the college football playoff era has kind of put the same sort of specter on college football coaches because as good as Lincoln Riley has been, you know, you know, they've had a trouble getting out of the blocks in the playoffs and, uh, and stay in there. So, you know, it'll be interesting. Like you said, seven years from now, see what the college football landscape uh, looks like. Hey, uh, before we go, uh, Boston, you got anything else you wanted to bring up on, on the Tim May podcast this week? I'm, just, I'm glad you just nodded no because we're running out of time. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, I'll save it for next week when I've already not wasted enough of your time. That's okay, man. I, I, oh, you know me, man. I love having conversations with you. I hope other people like listening to our conversations, fingers crossed. But you know what? Until next week, this is Tim May for Boston Ward, uh, the Tim May Podcast. We'll see you then. Thanks for watching. Subscribe below to get the latest videos from Letterman Row. We've got Letterman Live. We've got the practice report. we got rapid reaction. Hey, and you know we got Buck IQ with Zach Bourne. For sure. we got recruiting breakdowns with Berm. we got whatever you need. Ohio State football and Ohio State athletics, we've got you covered here at Letterman Row.